The man known to history as Robert the Bruce is believed to have been born at Turnbury Castle, Ayrshire, in southwest Scotland, on the 11th of July, 1274. His family were descended from the Norman nobility who came to England after the Norman invasion of 1066 and who were given lands and titles as a reward for their support by William the Conqueror. The first Robert Bruce came to prominence after he aided King David I of Scotland in his war to seize the Scottish throne after his illegitimate half-brother Malcolm had attempted to take the throne for himself. After they were successful, King David rewarded Robert by making him the first Lord of Annandale in 1124, which was a valley or dale through which ran the River Annan on the border region of Scotland and England. The Bruces had close ties of Norman England and continued to own considerable lands there, particularly in the north of the country, and on numerous occasions marriages were arranged between the Bruces and English families, meaning that Robert himself had English, Welsh, Norman, as well as Scottish ancestry. Indeed, Robert's own grandfather, the fifth Lord of Annandale, even fought alongside Edward I and his father, Henry III, at the Battle of Lewis against the forces of Simon de Montfort, over time, the Bruces increased their influence in southern Scotland until by the 1200s and the birth of the most famous Robert Bruce, the family's power base in southern Scotland was secure around the castles of Lochmarben and Turnbury and there is some debate to this day as to which of these castles was Robert's real birthplace. Little is known about Robert's childhood, but it is reasonable to assume, given that he was of noble birth, that he was well educated in various languages such as Gaelic, Anglo-Norman, French and Latin, and it is also reasonable to assume that he was well educated in philosophy and history, amongst other subjects. One of the first reports that still exists of Robert's early life is an account in the English chronicle Scala Chronica, written by Sir Thomas Gray, in which he states that Robert, for a time, at around the age of 18, was a bachelor in King Edward's chamber in 1292, King Edward being Edward I of England, or Edward the Longshanks as he was also known. There is also evidence that both Robert and his father were pursued for debt by merchants in Winchester, England in 1296, and there are also references to him being in the entourage of Scottish nobles and clergy around this time. These accounts further demonstrate that the Bruces had interests and close ties with both the nobility and the monarchy in England. And it is also fair to assume that Robert would have at least been at some point in the presence of Edward I, at least during his teenage years, or at least would have been known to Edward I. Then, at around the time that Robert would have reached adulthood, the political landscape in Scotland was thrown into the period of turmoil, which would eventually result in him becoming King of Scots. The troubles started when King Alexander III of Scotland died in 1286, without an obvious heir, as all of his children had also died over the previous decade. However, his daughter, Margaret, who had married the King of Norway, had given birth to a daughter, also named Margaret, in 1283, but had died herself during labour. This resulted in the King of Norway, Eric II, claiming that his daughter was now heir to the Scottish throne, despite her only being aged around three years old in 1286, Eric then appealed to the King of England, Edward I, to arbitrate for his daughter to be allowed to travel to Scotland to claim the throne, which resulted in Edward agreeing the Treaty of Burgham, in which the guardians of Scotland, who were high-ranking nobles and bishops, agreed to accept Margaret as Queen of Scots, and also, crucially, that she would be allowed to marry Edward I's son, Edward of Carnarvon, who would later become Edward II of England. This would have, in time, effectively resulted in the union of the English and Scottish crowns, even though the terms of the marriage and Treaty of Burgum stated that Scotland was to remain an independent kingdom. There is, however, little doubt that both the histories of Scotland and England would have been very different if Margaret had lived, and it could also be said that the failure of the marriage to Edward of Carnarvon was the point at which Edward I started to have designs on obtaining power in Scotland itself. The English king also took an active interest in the Scottish succession, as he was related to the young Princess Margaret, as she was the great-granddaughter of his own father, Henry III, 
through her mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, making Edward in turn her great-uncle. All seemed well, but the marriage of Margaret and Edward of Carnarvon was not to be, as she died on her way to Scotland of a seasickness-like illness, aged just seven years old, which threw open the Scottish succession once again. The next claimants in line for the Scottish throne were John Balliol of the House of Balliol and Robert's grandfather, the fifth Lord of Annandale, both of whom were descended from David I of Scotland, making the two first cousins. Indeed, the Bruce family's claim to the Scottish throne centred around Robert's great-grandmother, Isabel of Huntingdon, being in turn the great-granddaughter of David I of Scotland, meaning that Robert was the great-great-great-great-grandson of David I. The deadlock between the two claimants then resulted in over 100 auditors being appointed from the followers of both men in order to vote and decide on the succession, and King Edward I of England was then appointed to administer the outcome. But King Edward now, perhaps out of disappointment that his son had lost his chance of marrying the Queen of Scots, insisted that he should be appointed as Overlord of Scotland, meaning that all Scottish kings would have to pay homage to him as the King of England from then on, and provide him with troops and money when demanded. This had happened before, as Kings of Scotland had paid homage to the King of England for their lands south of the border, but Edward was now effectively demanding that the Scottish throne become subservient to that of England. The Scottish nobles initially refused to do so, as they stated that as there was no King of Scotland, they did not have the authority to grant England's overlordship of the country, and then deferred the decision to King Edward's demands, until a King of Scots was chosen. The King of England was then placed in charge of the Kingdom of Scotland until November of 1292, when John Balliol was chosen to be the next King of Scots. The English King then maintained his assertion that Balliol pay homage to him as Scotland's overlord, and proceeded to demand that Balliol send troops and money for Edward's wars in France, and also appear before England's Parliament to answer for his actions in disputes. King John and the Scottish nobility gradually grew more and more tired of Edward's interference in Scottish affairs, and then in 1295 established the Council of Twelve, which then sent emissaries to Philip IV of France, and formed an alliance of mutual assistance against England, now known as the Old Alliance, in which each country would come to the other's aid if the other was attacked. Robert the Bruce's father, the sixth Lord of Annandale, had aligned himself with Edward and the English in the lead-up to hostilities, as his family were now isolated in Scotland by his rival John Balliol coming to power, and he was then appointed by King Edward as the governor of Carlisle Castle in 1295, after the death of his father, making him the head of the Bruce family. John Balliol and the Scottish nobles then led an army south in 1296 and attacked Robert's father at Carlisle, but were forced to withdraw. This, along with Scotland's alliance with France, then spurred the King of England into action, as he clearly now saw Scotland as a vassal of England and therefore felt justified in taking military action against it. Edward had been amassing troops in northern England in case of an attack, and then invaded Scotland itself and brutally sacked the border city of Berwick-on-Tweed, after which the English forces advanced further north, capturing town after town with little resistance, until John Balliol himself was forced to surrender and he was then stripped of all of his offices. He then abdicated the Scottish throne in 1296, and was, after being held in the Tower of London, allowed to go into exile in France until his death in 1314. With Scotland now defeated and under his control, Edward I summoned his supporters to a victory parliament at Dunbar, at which Robert and his father swore loyalty to him, and they were then restored to their former lands at Annandale. After this, the Bruces continued to align themselves with England for the time being, even renting out property in the county of Essex, not far from Edward's estates in the area. This goes to show that Robert's father was still at least in appearance loyal to Edward, but by this time his son, who was now in his early twenties, was starting to question his father's association with the English. Events in Scotland soon changed once again, as unrest had been growing in the country since King Edward had seized power, 
which eventually resulted in a widespread revolt against English rule, led amongst others by William Wallace, who was a minor nobleman from western central Scotland, who along with other insurgents started to attack settlements, execute officials and harass the English forces stationed in the country. This insurrection grew and grew until Wallace joined forces with other nobles such as Andrew Murray, meaning that after a short time they had a small army which went on to cause havoc throughout Scotland. This was arguably the biggest turning point in the life of Robert the Bruce, as he now, after the outbreak of the revolts in Scotland, broke away from his father and joined a coalition of disaffected barons and clergy who had supported his grandfather's claim to the throne against John Balliol. Whether these men made it clear to Robert that with John Balliol gone, he was now the obvious choice as king is unclear, but it is certainly telling that he waited to change his allegiance against Edward I until both Balliol was deposed and there was a large scale uprising against English rule in Scotland. King Edward was at this time campaigning in France and had left his forces in the north under the command of the Earl of Surrey and Hugh de Cressingham, who then marched to retake northern Scotland, which was by this time in 1297 under the control of Wallace's army. This culminated in the English and Scottish armies meeting at the Battle of Stirling Bridge on the 11th of September 1297, in which the Earl of Surrey's army was forced to cross a narrow wooden bridge in order for them to advance to the north. Wallace's forces blocked their way however, and after allowing a few thousand English troops to cross the bridge, Wallace's army cut them off and killed all but a few hundred survivors. The Earl of Surrey then panicked and retreated south effectively meaning that the Scots had temporarily expelled the English from their country. The ramifications of this victory were felt throughout the British Isles and beyond, which led King Edward I to return from France after he had concluded a peace treaty there, and he then gathered a massive army which then marched north in 1298 to put down the uprising once and for all. The English King then advanced into Scotland and met Wallace's forces at the Battle of Falkirk on the 22nd of July 1298 in which the English were able to defeat the Scots and effectively end any hopes they had of immediate victory in the war. It is claimed that Robert the Bruce fought at the Battle of Falkirk on the side of the English in which he led a cavalry charge around the rear of Wallace's forces and broke up their formations. This is contested however as there is no direct evidence that Robert was at the Battle of Falkirk and given his actions around the time of the battle it does seem doubtful that he would have fought against those who he had only just recently joined forces with. Conversely, the Bruce's lands were not confiscated from them after Falkirk, which could be down to Robert being at the battle, or his father still being alive. Whatever the truth, after the battle, William Wallace, who had been appointed Guardian of Scotland after the Battle of Stirling, stepped down from his position and was replaced by Robert and John Comyn, who was the son of John Balliol's sister, making him Robert's closest rival to the throne. This rivalry eventually led to both men stepping down from their roles as guardians of Scotland, and after this Bruce seems to have had second thoughts about his cause, or possibly his chances of becoming king himself, as he then submitted to King Edward in 1301, whilst the English king was conducting a series of offensives in Scotland in the hope of finally securing power. These attacks largely failed to bring about a conclusive outcome, but the English had a major turn of fortune in 1305 when William Wallace was captured, taken to London and executed by being hung, drawn and quartered. 1305 was also an important year for Robert, as his elderly father had died the year before, making him the seventh Lord of Annandale, which could perhaps explain why he surrendered to the English as if his father had died whilst he had still been considered a traitor by King Edward, the English may have confiscated the Bruce family's lands. But whilst Robert was in England at King Edward's court, he received word to flee to Scotland, as his rival John Comyn had, according to accounts, spread the rumour that he was prepared to give up his claim to the Scottish throne in return for Bruce's lands in Scotland if Robert led an uprising in the country. This would have made Robert a target for King Edward, and he soon escaped back to Scotland where he arranged a meeting with Comyn at Greyfriars Church in Dunfries, 
on the 10th of February, 1306. At the meeting, Robert accused Comyn of betrayal, which resulted in a fight breaking out, during which Bruce stabbed his rival to death. Robert and his followers then moved to secure the backing of the other nobles and clergy in Scotland, but he was subsequently excommunicated from the church by the Pope, at King Edward's behest for having murdered Comyn, but a council so differ as to the chain of events that led to Bruce's rival's death. Some state that Robert stabbed Comyn after the fight broke out, others that Comyn was finished off by Bruce's followers, and yet other accounts say that Robert planned the murder of Comyn beforehand. Whatever the truth, Robert the Bruce had everything to gain from his rival's demise, as he was now the leading claimant to the throne in Scotland, but which also made him the prime target for Edward I and Comyn's followers. He then moved quickly, and under two months after Comyn's death, Robert the Bruce was crowned Robert I of Scotland on the 25th of March 1306, at the village of Schoon, not far from the city of Perth. There was now no going back for Robert, as in being crowned King of Scots, he could no longer change sides as he had done before, and was in the eyes of the English a traitor. It was now do or die for him, as he would have to use all of his ability and skill to overcome the massive English forces rallied against him. His power base in Scotland was still highly precarious, however, as many in the Scottish nobility and clergy had mistrusted him to start with, and now that he had murdered John Comyn, whom many had supported and backed to be king, Robert was almost as hated in Scotland as he was in England. King Edward I was, in 1306, becoming gravely ill, which meant that he was unable to travel north to take command in Scotland, so he then placed his forces in the north under the command of the Earl of Pembroke, who moved quickly to bring Bruce to battle. The English were joined against Robert by large numbers of nobles who had supported John Comyn, and Pembroke then made his base of operations in the city of Perth, where he awaited Robert's army. On his arrival, Bruce challenged Pembroke to leave Perth and engage in combat before the city's walls, but the Earl refused, leading Bruce to withdraw his army a few miles away from Perth to make camp. But Roberts failed to erect a stockade around his encampment, which was subsequently attacked by the English forces, which routed and decimated the Scottish army. Indeed, Robert himself was lucky to escape with his life. After this failure at the Battle of Methven, Robert was forced to go into hiding in the Highlands to escape the English who were now determined to subjugate Scotland and capture or kill Bruce himself. Indeed, the English more and more used brutal methods to bring the Scots to heel, which was down to King Edward clearly believing that Scotland was now his own domain, which in his eyes made any Scots that resisted him traitors rather than soldiers of another country's army. This was borne out by the English capturing and then suspending Robert's sister Mary in a cage outside the city of Roxburgh for nearly four years, and his brother Neil being hung, drawn and quartered after his capture, which was the death of a traitor. Robert, who had been hiding in the Western Isles, then returned to mainland Scotland in early 1307, and possibly being motivated by the capture of his family members and the execution of his brother, started a guerrilla campaign in the south of the country around his family's lands of Annandale. The Bruce had learned that he could not hope to defeat the superior English forces in open battle, but could gain the advantage over them by the use of hit-and-run tactics, light cavalry and pikemen, who were both a regular feature of Scottish armies in the period. He also had superior knowledge of the lands he was fighting in, and as he had returned to Scotland via Turnbury Castle, where he was born, he was able to build up a loyal and committed following. Indeed, 1307 seems to have marked one of the real turning points in Robert's life, and the fortunes of the Scots in their war for independence, as he seems to have learned from his past mistakes, and also seems to have been spurred on by the increasingly harsh measures the English were using in Scotland. Robert's new strategy then paid dividends, as he secured a number of important victories over his old enemy, the Earl of Pembroke, who had bested him at the Battle of Methven, by defeating him at a small engagement at the Glen of Trull, and a larger battle at Loudon Hill in the southern Scottish uplands. During the battle, Robert took up a strong defensive position on a plain near Loudon Hill, 
with his flanks covered by natural obstacles, which forced Pembroke to approach Robert's position down a narrow track, which essentially had the same effect as that at the Battle of Stirling, as the narrow approach the English were forced to take meant that they could only attack the Scots in a narrow front which neutralised their numerical advantage. The English were also unable to penetrate Bruce's pike formations, which culminated after a desperate fight in Pembroke's army being forced to retreat. These were Robert's first victories over the English, which garnered him support within Scotland, and also for the first time since William Wallace at the Battle of Stirling, a Scottish army had defeated an English army in a major engagement. It is also clear that Robert was very intelligent in his use of ground, and only fought the enemy where and when he was prepared to. The English commanders, in contrast, were, time and again, lured into a false sense of security by their superior numbers, and failed to see the traps that lay before them, or pay due respect and attention to the Scottish tactics. Then came the event which would, in many ways, be one of the crucial turning points in the war, as England's best commander and military leader, King Edward I himself died on his way north with an army to engage Robert on the 7th of July, 1307. This was a massive blow for the English and a huge boost for the Scots, as Edward was arguably one of the best military leaders England had in the Middle Ages, so his loss now meant that England's armies were never as well led, disciplined or as well prepared as they were before. There is also no doubt that the Scots were not only helped by the death of Edward I, but also by the fact that his son, Edward II, was a pale shadow of his father in terms of his suitability to be monarch. This was down to him preferring to indulge in his own personal desires, rather than take the responsibility of being king, which would ultimately, through his mistakes, result in disunity in England, which further hastened its defeat in the war and his own later downfall. Over the coming years, Robert moved to consolidate his power within Scotland by rounding up and defeating the remaining supporters of his former rival John Comyn, and also securing the control of the north of the country beyond the River Tay. He eventually strengthened his power base in Scotland by devastating the lands of Buchan in northern Scotland, which belonged to John Comyn, the Earl of Buchan, who was the cousin of Bruce's former arch-rival of the same name. Comyn was then forced to flee to England after the Battle of Inverurie in the summer of 1308, and after his forces had also defeated Comyn's allies of the Clan MacDougall, King Robert now effectively had control over the majority of Scotland to the point that his support in the country was stronger than ever. He then wrote King Edward II proposing a peace between them both, which was rejected, which prompted Robert to continue to secure the castles in Scotland, which were still held by the English, until in 1312 and 1313, he conducted raids in Northern England and on the Isle of Man, which forced Edward II to take action. The English king had done little to contain Robert's aggression over the previous seven years, and then in 1314, when Robert's brother Edward laid siege to the strategically crucial castle at Stirling, which the English could not afford to lose, as it controlled access to and from the Highlands, Edward was forced into belated action. The English king then raised a massive force, numbering upwards of 20,000 troops, which marched north to aid the besieged Stirling Castle. Robert now had little choice but to engage Edward in open battle, which he had not done before, and defeat would almost certainly mean that Scottish independence was impossible. The two armies then met on the banks of a small river named the Bannock Burn, southeast of Stirling on the 23rd of June 1314, with the Scottish positions on the western bank of the river between King Edward's army and Stirling Castle, meaning that the English would have to fight their way through Robert's army to relieve Stirling Castle. Then, on the morning of the 23rd of June, the English sent a contingent of their cavalry across the Bannock Burn to gain a bridgehead, but were met by a Scottish infantry commanded by King Robert himself. Then, one of the knights in the English force, named Henry de Bouin, charged King Robert armed with his lance and shield in an effort to kill him. 
Roberts then dodged Buon's lance, and when the impetuous English knight drew level with him, delivered a crushing blow to his foe's head with his axe, killing him instantly. This no doubt had contrasting effects on the morale of both armies, and the English cavalry were then soon forced to withdraw back across the Bannockburn. King Edward then ceased hostilities for the night, but the next day along with his commanders decided to cross the Bannockburn again, this time in force to engage the Scots head on. Initially all went according to plan, but as the English advanced towards the Scottish positions, they were steadily forced back by King Robert's pikemen, and being unable to outflank the Scots due to there being rivers on each of their flanks, and also being unable to penetrate the Scottish pike formations, Edward's army was slowly worn down and pushed back, until by the end of the day, realising that he could not gain victory, King Edward fled, resulting in a full-scale rout of his army. The English lost nearly 12,000 troops at Bannockburn, which was a devastating defeat that effectively decided the war, and Robert had proved himself to be not only a superb guerrilla commander, but also a brilliant commander in open battle. Indeed, the Battle of Bannockburn was the decisive battle in the Scottish Wars of Independence, and meant that Robert's status as King of Scots was secured, as was his status as a hero and national icon in Scotland, which was now confirmed for all time. King Edward's reputation, in contrast, was dealt a severe blow after Bannockburn, as England had lost tens of thousands of troops in the conflict, and its population had been taxed to breaking point by the English king and his father. Indeed, Edward himself was later deposed as king by his own wife, Isabella, and her lover, Roger Mortimer, in 1327, and was then murdered in the same year. Now that Scotland was secure as an independent kingdom, Robert decided to take the war to the English by sending his brother Edward to Ireland, which was under English control, in the hope of weakening English power in the country. But Edward was always outnumbered in the war in Ireland, which eventually ended with him being killed in the Battle of Falkart in 1318, resulting in a Scottish defeat. Robert's later reign as King of Scots saw a period of relative peace in Scotland, as England did not have the unity or strength to challenge him. His excommunication was eventually lifted by the Pope in 1328, and a final peace treaty with the English was signed in the same year by Queen Isabella and Roger Mortimer on behalf of the young King Edward III, in which they relinquished all claims the English crown had over the Scottish throne. King Robert had now accomplished everything he could have dreamt of in his lifetime, and by 1329 his health was failing rapidly, possibly down to the effects of leprosy and other conditions, but the cause of his ill health is still the topic of some debate. The King of Scots then died on the 7th of June 1329 at the Manor of Cardross near Dunbarton, at the relatively young age of 54. Some accounts state that Robert left instructions that his heart should be removed from his body and then taken to Jerusalem to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is Christ's birthplace, although other accounts say he merely wanted his heart to be carried in battle against Christ's enemies on crusade. Sir James Douglas then had Robert's heart placed in a silver casket around his neck and then left Scotland on crusade against the Moors in Spain but Douglas was eventually killed in battle, leading to Robert's heart eventually being brought back to Scotland and buried in Melrose Abbey until in 1920 a box containing human remains was found and then reburied until it was found again in 1998 and buried within the grounds of Melrose Abbey once again. Robert the Bruce, or Robert I of Scotland, is widely seen today as the most important single figure in Scottish history as without him it is highly probable that the country would, like Wales, become an English vassal-like state. No one can deny that Robert the Bruce single-handedly transformed Scotland's fortunes in the wars of independence and brilliantly realised the strengths of his own troops as well as the weaknesses of his enemies in order to obtain victory. It could be said that he was an opportunist, but in many ways he had to be to survive the most tumultuous time in Scotland's history, 
and for Robert and his countrymen to defeat the vastly superior English forces rallied against them is a testament to his intelligence and his ability. Indeed, in recent times, William Wallace has been largely seen as the icon of Scottish resistance in the wars of Scottish independence, but in reality, the real hero was Robert the Bruce, King of Scots. I will end this video by simply quoting the inscription that was written on Robert the Bruce's tomb at Dunfermline Abbey. Here lies the invincible, blessed King Robert. Whoever reads about his feats will repeat the many battles he fought. By his integrity, he guided to liberty the Kingdom of the Scots. May he now live in heaven.